Hey students, welcome back. And today we are going to get into Native Americans and the mission system. We're going to be talking about the time span from about 1769 to the 1820s. And this will correspond to information in your textbook found on ch in chapter two, pages 35 to 41. Okay, so we're gonna begin our lecture today with the lecture questions. And just as a reminder, the lecture questions are the questions that hopefully this lecture will answer. Um, and so they're kind of just guiding us and getting us warmed up, thinking about the types of things that we will be discussing over the course of this lecture. So the first lecture question is, why did the Spanish want to colonize Alta California and what was their goal after the missions were established? So why did the Spanish even bother coming up to Alta California? After all, it did require resources and manpower and all kinds of other things. Why did they decide to do that? And what was their goal once they were here? Number two is how did the mission system impact the indigenous population of California? Number three, is how did the mission Indians resist and or adapt to Spanish colonization? So here we have a list of the key terms to, for our lecture today. Again, as a reminder, the key terms are your guidepost through the lecture. So it's a good idea to know the key terms before going into the lecture because these are the things that you are going to be expected to know for an exam, for a quiz, um, and you know for writing IDs, etc. Okay, so let's begin with just a basic overview here. So in 1769, the Spanish decide to take an expedition up to Alta California for the purpose of establishing missions. And missions were the primary way that the Spanish colonized throughout the Americas. They typically went, you know, because in the Spain, you're talking about a monarchy and the monarchy worked very closely, kind of hand in hand with the Catholic Church. So the two methods of conquest were military via the, the king's soldiers and church via the Catholic church and the missionizing process. So the whole purpose of the colonization process was to convert the indigenous population and to set up military forts to defend those missions and then also eventually to defend the pueblos or the towns and cities that would arise in this colonized region. The Spanish understood that the indigenous populations could be a very strong and powerful source of labor. Um, and they also understood that the indigenous populations already existed and could be converted over to their religion, thereby then uh, essentially devoting themselves to Spain and devoting their loyalty to the king. So eventually 21 missions will stretch from San Diego in the south of Alta California all the way to Solano, which is essentially Central California. They never did get past, um, you know, Central California. Just a little bit north of San Francisco is where the Solano mission is. Obviously, the lives of Native people will be transformed forever. As to why the Spanish wanted to come to Alta California, their primary motivation was competition, both with England and with the Russians, but especially the English. They had knew that the English had already established themselves on the eastern seaboard of North America, and they wanted to ensure that their influence didn't spread to the West Coast. Keep in mind, of course, that New Spain headquartered in Mexico City, was already well established by this time. And there were also missions in Baja, California. So the Spanish had a pretty good jumping off point to get to Alta, California from. 
So before we talk about the missionization process and what it was like for the indigenous population, we first need to kind of understand Spanish law as it relates to indigenous populations. So there's a, a sort of generic law book, a code book um, in Spain called the Law of the Indies. Um, this is a, a book of laws that was specifically adopted in order to create laws for the new world. You know, of course, the Spanish, um, they, they were the ones that sponsored Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus comes over in 1492. So the Spanish are the first to make first contact in what comes to be known as the new world. And so they wanted to draft a series of laws that would essentially regulate the colonization of this new world. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that the law of the Indies was pretty specific about the treatment of indigenous peoples. One of the things that Christopher Columbus did after his first voyage was he brought back some indigenous people to present to Queen Isabella. And she is, she is supposed to have said that she doesn't want these people to be enslaved, that she wants these people instead to be seen more like children and that they should be brought into the fold of Spanish society as much as possible. And for the Spanish, the first step in making that happen was to convert them to Christianity. So the mission system was created specifically to do that. And um, eventually it was, it was supposed to be a temporary institution that, uh, that would basically only last about 10 years. And after 10 years, the missions would become secularized. So in other words, the missions would exist as a um, big kind of industries like basically like conversion uh, centers, but also industries for about 10 years. And then after a 10 year period of time, they would be secularized. Now that doesn't mean that they no longer serve as a religious institution, but they would no longer serve as kind of a bigger, broader industry, but they would be shrunk down to be like Paris, you know, like, um, uh, just little chapels and air, little areas of worship, essentially churches. And so that was the idea behind it. And the reason uh, why the 10-year expiration was put on uh, the mission system for the Law of the Indies is that the, the Spanish really wanted to encourage that the indigenous populations would eventually become like regular Spanish citizens, for lack of a better word, essentially subjects of the king. There wasn't really a sense of citizenship per se as we understand it today, but essentially that they would become subjects of the king, that they, over the course of their missionization, would not only become Christian, but they would also acquire skills necessary in order to carry out, you know, the day-to-day -day tasks and duties of, you know, living in Spanish society. So that was, that was basically the plan. And that was also the plan in Alta California. However, in Alta California, things didn't go as was normally planned. In fact, after 10 years of the mission system, the padres and the priests at the missions argued um, with Mexico City and with the central governing body of New Spain that the native people in California simply were not ready um, to make this transition into um, being subjects of the king and in, into having their own communities. Now, there are a lot of different theories as to why the priests were saying this about the California Indians. Um, the first is that the California Indians provided a much needed source of labor for the missions, right? The, they were the source of labor for the missions. So not only did they build and maintain the missions, but they also kept the missions up and running operational. So they did the day-to-day -day activities that required um, th that were required to keep the missions operational. That would include working in the fields, working at the blacksmith shop, um, ranching, uh, weaving, cooking food, of course, um, cr you know, creating um, candles. 
um, all of the things that were just kind of part of the day-to-day -day operation. And the priests relied upon the native population of Alta California in order to get that done because there simply were not enough Spaniards coming to Alta California. The second reason is that just generally, and I talked about this in my last lecture, that the Spanish regarded the native people of California as being particularly primitive. And, um, and it took them a long time in order to convert um, the indigenous population of Alta California to Christianity. So it took them a long time just to earn the basic trust of um, the people. And so that's another reason why we believe that um, the priests were so hesitant to make this transition. Um, this was actually a point of contention between, um, you know, Mexico City and the central and governing body of New Spain and Alta California and the priest hierarchy that existed there in the mission system. Okay, so we are going to talk more about Yunipera Serra and um, the expedition that went up into Alta California when we talk specifically about um, Spanish California. But for now, um, Father Yunipera Serra, 1769, leads an expedition um, across land from Baja up to San Diego. At that point, the first mission is going to be established in San Diego, and eventually the second mission will be established in Monterey. Um, presidios, which are also known as military forts, were established near the missions initially to protect the missions and the inhabitants of the missions. But as I said later on, their job was also to protect um, the pueblos and the towns that were established. It took an entire year for the first Indian to permanently convert to Christianity at the San Diego mission. So um, the way that it was done is that, um, you know, they would, they would go to a location and they would erect a bell and then they would ring the bell and they would try to lure the native people to come to the location out of curiosity or maybe perhaps they might um, cook something and natives might smell the food. And the whole idea was to kind of lure them in. Um, and then once they were lured in to kind of communicate. And again, there would have been a communication gap between these two peoples, but um, there, there was a lot of sign language that was used. A lot of the iconography that is used in Catholicism, such as the crucifix and also images of the Virgin Mary were very compelling and interesting to the native people. And in fact, we have a lot of uh, uh, primary source accounts of um, native women in particular really being drawn to images of the Virgin Mary. So there was all these different ways that um, the priests would try to lure the local uh, indigenous populations into um, the mission. Um, they would also, you know, show them various tools that the Spanish had that they had never seen before. And so again, this was another way to try to get them to come into their fold. However, we know for a fact that the first Native people to spot the Spanish, that when they came into San Diego, because there was another expedition that was coming through this via the sea, and, um, and when they arrived in the San Diego Bay, there was an earthquake and there was an eclipse. And both of these things, the native people thought of as being bad omens. And so initially um, they had a really difficult time trying to earn the trust of the native people. And as I said, the first successful baptism will not take place until a year after the, the Spanish had been there and begun to establish the mission there in San Diego. Okay, so who was impacted by the mission system? Well, primarily native tribes living in close proximity to the missions were the ones that would have been impacted the most by uh, the changes that the mission system brought along. 
As I mentioned, um, what when the Spanish first arrived in Alta California, they had this very sort of elaborate ritual that they did in order to claim the land for the king and Christ, and then they would erect a cross, and then they would ring bells to try to, you know, attract the Native people in the surrounding area, and then there might be gift exchange or whatever, and maybe some of the Native people might choose to hang around the mission and kind of check it out and might be curious about um, the newcomers. But after time, um, the Spanish begin to be much more aggressive about rounding um, people up um, and bringing them to the mission. And, you know, the mission provided regular meals. And so a lot of the native people would have been drawn to the mission for several, you know, multiple reasons. Uh, number one, out of curiosity, right? Number two, the need for food. Um, or at least a consistent supply of food, um, the need for supplies. So the Spanish brought with them, of course, tools that were unfamiliar to the native people, weapons that were unfamiliar to the native people. And so the, the natives basically over time, they become dependent upon this system. Um, they begin to lose their traditional ways of life. And so they are they are essentially forced to remain um, within the boundaries of the mission walls and we'll talk about what their daily life would have been like on the next slide but you can see that within the 50 years that the mission system was really up and running in alta california the population of coastal indians decreases dramatically from an estimated 72,000 to about 18,000. Now, a lot of this was due to disease. Um, the exposure of, of diseases like smallpox, even certain strains of influenza, would have impacted the native population and in many cases killed them. And so that's that was the primary way that native people died um, w during this time period was through exposure to disease. But there was also punishments um, that were given out as well. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more um, in a minute. So once um, the native people were kind of captive audiences within the mission walls, um, they would have eventually, if they were going to stay there, have been forced to convert to Catholicism and be baptized. And once they were baptized, um, they were um, called neophytes, and then they would basically be living under the direct authority of the padre or the priest. So he would have ultimate control over um, their assigned jobs. Um, obviously, you know, when they ate, um, when they went to bed, um, all of the daily activities were very much regimented. And we'll talk about that also in a minute. Um, for children, if the children were, um, you know, there with their parents, there wasn't, the, you had to basically enroll them into a catechism course, essentially a conversion course so that they were actively converting and learning about um, Catholicism. And daily prayer, of course, was mandatory for everybody um, who was uh, living within the mission walls. Now, Running away was not an uncommon thing. Um, and again, as time goes on, the Spanish become more and more emboldened and they begin to um, hunt down people who try to run from the mission. And the runaway rate from the mission was anywhere between five to 15%, um, depending upon the mission, depending upon the priest that was in charge, some priests were crueler than others. Um, and so, you know, in those particular circumstances, um, people would try to run away more frequently. Um, but it becomes a pretty bad once we get into right around 1800, um, where the mission systems are pretty well established. And again, the Spanish become more and more emboldened in their efforts to um, convert indigenous populations. And of course, if indigenous populations are dying while they are in the, you know, under the care of the missions, 
um, then of course the missions are gonna need to replenish that labor force somehow. And so that's, again, gives them another incentive to becoming you know, more and more aggressive in going out and recruiting Native people, but also ensuring that they do not run away. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the daily lives of the neophytes. So again, the neophytes are, is the name that is given to mission Indians who have been baptized. And their daily life was very highly regimented um, by time, and time was regulated through the mission bells. So days would begin very early, typically around 5 a.m., and they would begin early with a simple meal and prayer. So it would probably be just a meal of some type of maybe um, a, a grain, or mush, um, like an acorn mush or something like that. Very, very simple meal. Um, and then there would be work until about noon. Now, what kind of work um, did the Mission Indians do? Well, obviously you had the work of building um, the buildings and maintaining the buildings, but more specifically, there were things like tanning leather. So the, the Spanish brought with them cattle and cattle, and also, uh, you know, creating um, the leather to make saddles and shoes and hats and those types of things required tanning of the animal skin. There was also, of course, as I mentioned, herding, raising and managing livestock, um, such as cattle, but also sheep and goats, um, and also the branding of those animals. So each mission had their own um, specific brand that they used um, to identify who, who their animals were. Uh, another job might be making of roof tiles and adobe bricks. Um, these were the, you know, uh, building materials that were used to create the missions. Uh, maybe working on a forge, um, a furnace, like in a blacksmith shop, you know, to make um, carts and wheels and branding irons, um, locks and keys and those types of things. Um, the making of soap and candles, which was often the job of women, and they would use the tallow and fat from the cattle. Um, weaving wool for cloth, again, another um, job that was often given to women. Um, grinding corn, making tortillas. Again, women would often do that type of work. Working in the fields and planting, harvesting wheat, barley, corn, and vegetables. Um, planting and tending to orchards like peaches, apricots, walnuts, figs, red and green grapes to make wine, oranges, pears, olives used for cooking oil and lamp oil. Um, and date palms. All of these things were grown um, within the mission grounds. And we're, we're talking about acres and acres of land, hundreds, in some cases, thousands of acres of land were part of these Spanish land grants for these um, missions initially. So there was a lot of stuff to do um, on a daily basis. So back to the daily lives. Um, so you work until about noon, um, and then there would be a siesta, and then you would work again until sunset. So siesta was a time for rest, um, if the, the hottest part of the day, the midday, um, and then there would be a, a mass said in the middle of the day, and then there would be work again until sunset. Now, all work and housing was segregated by sex. So as I was mentioning those jobs, I mentioned the jobs that were done by women, the other jobs were typically done by men, and at night, um, the housing was segregated uh, by sex. The work would last for five to eight hours a day. All of the language spoken around the mission would have been Spanish, and all lessons would have been given in Spanish. So these would have been lessons, um, the religious lessons that were given, the catechisms, and also all of the lessons that were given to the children would all be in Spanish. It was considered um, bad um, to speak your native tongue. It was discouraged. Um, roll call was taken at every meal. 
Um, so you're talking about, you know, meals where um, they could check to ensure that everybody was present. Um, and this is typically where they found out if somebody had tried to run away or had strayed away from the mission for some reason. And again, punishments were given to people who did not follow this very strict daily protocol. So um, you can link to this video here, um, and it is just a about a five minute long um, video that will give you a little bit more of an introduction about um, California natives and Spanish contact, the mission system specifically. There's some really great images that um, also accompany this documentary clip. So I encourage, encourage you to click on it. It's not required, but I encourage you if you'd like. Okay, so one of the things that is talked about a lot is the rigors of mission life for Native people in California. And um, certainly that is true. And punishments were common, and there was sometimes uh, times of shortages of food. Uh, and of course, you also have this forced uh, religious conversion. So there were a lot of reasons um, for Native people to resist um, and for the Mission Indians, the neophytes, to rise up and resist. And one of the things I like to do when I teach about Indigenous history is talk about how uh, Indigenous people were not just victims, but they also were empowered in certain ways. Um, not only did they actively resist in some cases, like through uprisings and violent attacks and things, but there were also many instances of just passive acts of resistance. Um, and so I think that that's a really interesting part of the history of any oppressed people is that, yes, they are victims of injustices, but at the same time, it's a uh, it's a testament to the human spirit that people will endure and people will resist and, um, and that the human spirit is, is really ultimately very, very strong, um, adaptable, um, and very powerful and very difficult um, to break. Um, so during the mission period, there were many uprisings led by Native Americans. Um, we know about them primarily through the priests themselves who would often have to write back to Mexico City and explain um, why there was a dead priest or why, um, you know, all of the mission Indians um, left um, the mission or whatever, you know. So they kept really good documents of a lot of these things, and that's how we know the details. That being said, that means that we only know one side of the story. Right. So we know what the Spanish say about these uprisings. So it's a little bit difficult to get a super clear picture of this. Um, one of the, the cool things about Toy Perina, who we're going to talk about in this lecture, is that we do have transcripts of her court hearing. Um, and so we do know what she said in her own words. So that's really in a very important document because we know that she said that because it was transcribed in the court. Um, so, uh, so just keep that in mind moving forward as we do talk about these examples of resistance. Um, much of what we know about this is really sort of one-sided history. So let's talk about the reasons why uh, neophytes would rise up and resist. And I'm sure you can imagine a lot of the reasons why. But, um, you know, number one is that we know that the biggest killer of native Californians were the diseases that the Spanish brought. And so the fact that um, native people were getting sick and dying in very large numbers, this would have been very confusing and frightening. Um, to the Native people, and imagine what it would have been like to be somebody who was sick or whose family member was sick, and you were stuck in this mission, and they weren't going to let you leave. And obviously, if you're, if you're sick or if your family member's sick, it would be difficult for you to leave anyway. That's going to cause a lot of discontent um, and a lot of suspicion and a lot of mistrust. 
Um, secondly, you have the punishments, um, and these punishments could be very violent. Yanipara Sarah himself was known for was known to um, whip mission Indians um, if they misbehaved. And so this was, uh, you know, and they, it, it was something that um, we see in a lot of the accounts. Um, some of the priests really abused that power. And, um, and of course, that's going to cause a lot of anger um, and resentment. Number three is um, something that I think um, we really are starting to learn more about as um, historians of California history, it's becoming clearer and clearer that the rape of Indian women um, by Spanish soldiers in particular was um, not only very common, but especially brutal um, and oftentimes included children, um, girls. And so um, we know this from the documents. We know that this was one of the biggest reasons why um, Native people didn't trust the Spanish was these acts of rape. And we know that the rape occurred, although the Spanish don't acknowledge it very often. Um, it is written in their documents. Um, Yenipur Serra, when he established the first mission in Monterey, um, established it pretty close to the Presidio and then ended up having to move the mission to the other side of the Monterey Peninsula so that the soldiers would not have access to the women. And he writes about that. I mean, he's reporting that in his own words. Um, so we know that that was a thing. Um, we also have um, some instances of really horrific, um, violent um, rapes of girls that were documented by priests that were so horrified by it that they, they couldn't you know, not uh, write about it or say something or report it um, back to Mexico City. So we know that that was something. So um, these little glimpses that we see from the official record tell us um, that the rape of Indian women was um, very common, um, particularly brutal, and was a major reason why Native people did not trust, over time, trust the Spanish and then finally, we have the fact that occasionally food was scarce. Um, keep in mind, of course, that these are very remote colonial outposts. Um, if there was times of drought or if there was a bad harvest for whatever reason, um, there could be a food shortage. And the first people to get cut off from the food supply would have been the Mission Indians. So um, if that was happening, then there, that could have caused uprisings as well. So this is not a, a, um, a cohesive list. I mean, in other words, there could be other reasons why Native people rose up, but the documents show that this was the most, these were the most common reasons why um, Native people appear to have uh, be rising up and resisting and actively fighting against the Spanish. Okay, so we're going to begin by talking about the first uh, documented uh, resistance by Native people in California, the Kumaye Uprising. This happens in 1775, so we're talking six years after the establishment of the first mission in San Diego, and it happens in San Diego at the San Diego Mission. Um, this was a massive uprising by all accounts, uh, somewhere around a thousand Kumaye Indians attacked the San Diego mission and they killed the priest there, Father Louis Jaime and a blacksmith and a carpenter. And again, because we don't know the story from the native perspective, um, what what the story that the Spanish gave or how they understood it anyway was that the attack began after an Indian had been punished for stealing a fish. So we don't know if this might have been one of those times where food was scarce um, or maybe, you know, perhaps, you know, because they were working the native uh, people so hard at the mission, they were just hungry and they needed more food. We don't know. 
We also don't know if there were other motivations. Um, I suspect that there were um, only because of the size of this uprising and the violence of this uprising. There are several times um, throughout the history of the mission system where native people rose up and killed the priests. And in this, and it's always in cases of really sort of um, severe oppression in some way. So either Father Lewis Jaime was um, punishing the native people, the Kuma A uh, natives um, at the mission, or perhaps he was not protecting them. Um, perhaps uh, the Indian women were getting raped. Um, we really don't know, but we do know that this is the first major Indian uprising in 1775 at the San Diego mission. Okay, so moving on now to tell the story of Toy Perina, who you're going to read about as one of your assignments this week. So I'm going to move through this uh, material kind of quickly because you will get a lot of detail after reading that article about her planned uprising. But essentially, Toy Perina is a Tongva Gabrielino medicine woman slash communicator, tribal leader. And in 1785, uh, it appears that she planned a organized revolt at Mission San Gabriel, which is um, in the San Fernando Valley. She allegedly allied herself with the local chiefs um, and a neophyte who it is said was upset because the friars and the priest would not allow the Indians to practice their traditional dances. So it's interesting that we see this. There has been mixed accounts um, regarding this issue of cultural suppression. Um, in some cases, uh, we see that um, the priests allowed the native people to celebrate some of their um, traditional ceremonies and rituals and celebrations and that kind of thing at the mission. Um, in other cases, like this example right here, it appears that those types of activities were suppressed. So again, it really did um, depend upon the priest um, that was heading up the mission. It also depended upon what um, the time it was, like when, when, what time period we're talking about, because as time went on, you can see that these revolts are early on, but as time went on, um, the priest began to realize that allowing um, the mission Indians to celebrate some of their traditional ceremonies kept the peace, so to speak. So, um, but it does not surprise me that in 1785 um, that this was an issue, that this um, type of cultural expression was being suppressed. So Toy Perina is allegedly, you know, planning this massive rebellion. She's getting um, the support of local chiefs and the neophytes. And unfortunately, their rebellion was discovered. One of the things that was a hazard of um, having the, uh, the missions and having the mission Indians was that everybody was learning Spanish. And so um, the, there was a soldier who happened to overhear um, a group of Native people talking about this planned rebellion. And he was able to understand what they were saying. And ultimately, um, Toy Perina will be arrested as being the primary um, instigator, conspi conspirator um, behind this rebellion. Um, she was punished um, pretty severely. Not only was she physically punished um, by being flogged, but she was also exiled, and she was exiled to Northern California to uh, the Carmel Mission, where she was forced to convert to Christianity and ultimately ends up marrying a Spanish soldier, which uh, for a lot of the mission Indians, uh, women in the mission um, missions, um, this was the ultimate uh, fate of them, is that they ended up marrying a Spaniard. And um, so... 
Um, but as I mentioned, one of the unique things about Toy Perina is that we do have her um, court transcripts. And so as you can see here, I've put a quote down here under this image of the San Gabriel mission of her, um, of what she said while she was on the stand. And she admitted um, that she had helped organize um, this rebellion. And she said, I commanded him to do so for I hate the Padres and all of you for trespassing on the land of my forefathers. So we know that if she believes this, if she thinks this, she's not the only one that believes this, right? So again, as historians, we try to take just little bits of what we can find in the documents and try to go, okay, well, it doesn't make sense that she, as, especially as uh, revered of a person as she was in her local community, it doesn't make sense that she would be the only one that believes this, right? That thinks this way. So we know that indeed, um, she was expressing the sentiment of many of the Mission Indians at the time. And here we have a mural to Toy Perina that was painted in uh, 2009. Um, it's located in East Los Angeles. Um, and uh, that article actually talks a little bit about how Toy Perina has been been memorialized um, on the landscape uh, throughout Southern California as her story has now been uncovered um, and retold and her bravery um, is now being celebrated. Okay, so there are many other examples of um, uprisings but I'm gonna to finish today by talking about the Estanislao uprising. And I use this as kind of a comparative because this is one that happens later um, in the Spanish period in 1828. In fact, it's actually into the Mexican period um, because Mexico uh, it wins its independence in 1821. So this is into the Mexican period of California history. It's 1828. Estanislao is a Yukut Indian, um, and he is a former Indian alcade who, um, and the alcades were essentially the uh, mission Indians that were recruited by the priests to oversee the other mission Indians. Um, and he decides that he's gonna run away um, from the San Jose um, mission. And he is very upset at the mission system. And uh, we're not sure exactly the, his motivations, although um, a lot of people believe that probably Estanislao was feeling very insecure um, about his position in the mission because of the transition during this time um, from the missions being these big industries to being secularized. Um, and that happens after uh, Mexico wins its independence and California becomes part of Mexico. So um, that's probably the motivation here was that he really saw his position at the mission as being threatened. Um, but no matter his motivation, he decides that he's going to leave the mission um, and he goes into the Central Valley, the San Joaquin Valley of California, and he begins to communicate with all of these local tribes. So this is an example of how tribal groups in California are now going to be able to communicate with each other because many of them have been exposed to Spanish. So remember how um, these different tribal communities, initially you've got a hundred different languages that are being spoke throughout California, um, pre-contact, after contact, um, a lot of these tribal groups are going to um, learn Spanish, be exposed to Spanish, and they can then communicate using the Spanish language. So kind of ironically here, the Spanish have given these tribes the tools um, to create these big resistance movements. And that's exactly what he does. Um, in 1829, he assembles this gigantic force, this, you know, um, this coalition of tribes throughout the Central Valley. And he actually successfully fights back um, the 
uh, the native, or excuse me, the uh, Californios and others who are trying to um, put down this rebellion. And eventually um, he will return to uh, Mission San Jose in 1834 and kind of give himself up. Um, and it appears that he does this in order to save his life because had he not done that, um, he would have been imprisoned and probably killed um, for his role in organizing this massive uh, resistance to the Spanish. Um, he And as I mentioned, they do successfully hold up and fight back the Spanish on multiple, multiple occasions. Um, there's also uh, this this is also kind of an interesting story because of the fact that here you have a mission Indian who obviously was highly respected within the mission system because he was given the title of al Qaeda, And so he had this, this power within the mission, but he saw that that power would eventually be stripped from him because of the secularization process so he goes out and tries to organize this resistance, um, recognizing that the Spanish never really wanted um, necessarily to, you know, take the Mission Indians in forever, but that eventually they would have to go out on their own. And he was resisting against that. It's probably true that he was also resisting against punishments and high death rates and, and that as well. But um, it, his return to the mission, I think, is also very telling, right? He returns back to Mission San Jose in 1834, and he essentially says that, you know, he uh, apologizes for his um, insubordination um, and eventually just essentially begs for mercy. So it's an interesting arc to a Stanislaus um, life. Here you see a... A modern um, statue uh, to him um, commemorating uh, his uprising. Okay, so this is the final slide today, and basically, um, we're going to just kind of summarize the impact of the mission system on Native people. Um, as you can see, by the end of the mission period, which is essentially the mid-1820s, that's when that transitional period between the governance of the mission by Spain and the beginning of secularization by the Mexican government, um, the overall population of California Indians will have declined by 50%. So if you say that the population was 300,000, of course, that's 150,000 by the end of that mission period period. Um, some populations declined as much as 75% if you were in closer proximity or if your tribe had a lot of participation in the mission system. Obviously, the land has been altered by the presence of the Spanish, um, the introduction of hooved animals, the introduction of non-native plants, um, and, uh, you know, were two of the um, biggest things that were happening. Of course, you also have the fishing that's happening on the coast. You have the processing of leather, which is also going to impact the environment, the hides. Um, so the, the environment is definitely being impacted here. And, of course, Native people's uh, traditional ways of life are going to be altered forever, particularly the tribes that are going to be heavily impacted by the mission system. Uh, the mission system, similar to the reservation system that we see in the United States in the latter part of the 19th century, is really going to create a cycle of dependency for Native people. Um, where, you know, you, you go into the mission, you become accustomed to um, the ways of life and being fed and, and working and, and all of these things. And in the process, you are being stripped of your traditional knowledge, right? Because you're not in um, your traditional native environments. So especially for the children um, that got brought to the missions early on and then grew up in the mission system, um, when the mission system is dismantled, um, when it, the missions are secularized, this is going to have a major impact on those mission Indians in particular who really don't know 
any other way of life. All right, so that's it for today. And this is also going to conclude um, the material for this week, week one. I've gone really light on the material for week one because I want you to become uh, really familiar with the syllabus and also with how to write a historic ID and some of just the basics of the course. So I've, I've been light on the lecture for this week. Next, year, next week, expect to have four lectures, um, one basically for each day that we would be meeting um, in class in person. All right, that's it for all. Now, please let me know if you have any questions, email me or come and see me in Zoom office hours. Have a good one, guys. Bye.